money that I'm making doing the side hustle is actually coming right back to my wallet instead of it having to go through someone else and then come back to me. So I'm like, I gotta get into entrepreneurship. I either wanna get into tech, into real estate, because those two seem like the most generally successful as far as building and creating wealth. Read Rich Dad Poor Dad twice, got into real estate, uh, five years ago, I met my, my mentor at the time, who's now a business partner. His name is Hunter Thompson. Not the fear and loathing in Las Vegas, Hunter Thompson. But I uh, just go to RaisingCapitalForRealEstate.com if you want to know who I'm talking about. Um, that's, my, that's my homie there. And when we started Raise Masters, the number one mastermind for elite capital raisers a year and a half ago. We have 250 clients that are raising money for uh, commercial real estate deals across the U.S. and a few other sectors and asset classes. So. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, somewhere in that whole journey, kind of realized, wow, um, anything that has little to no government involvement typically tends to do better. And uh, started getting going down a few rabbit holes after I bought some Bitcoin. On you know why is it that the government hates Bitcoin? And you know, for the most part, it's hard for them to track it. They can't tax it, and that's when I started going down the taxation and theft rabbit hole. And uh, just happy to be here today with like-minded individuals. Call us libertarians, anarcho-capitalists, or as my buddy Mark Victor says, I'm a live and let live guy. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that's that. End it. of the day, that's it. Love it. So, um, Giants like Adam, can you can you lead a dis uh, moderate a panel at the, at the event? And I'm like, sure. I mean, I'm a podcaster. I can I can moderate just about anything. And then the brochure comes out. And it just says discussion led by Adam Carswell. I'm like, okay, so you just want me to get up there and talk for an hour and a half? Like, I, I don't know. So anyways, by the way, shout out to Doug Casey. He is the one who connected us originally. I know he couldn't be here today, but I understand he spoke here before. So Doug, if you're watching the replay, we miss you. We'll see you next time. Um, but yeah, so since I'm kind of in control now, I wanted to bring up two people that I got to know a little bit before today and have them talk about some topics that maybe we touched on, but could go a little bit deeper. And so we'd make a little bit of a peanut butter jelly sandwich here today, we've got the topic of being the live and let live guy in your community combined with Austrian economics. That's Walter Block's specialty. And I know uh, Austrian economics are probably a big reason why I'm here today without even realizing it. I kind of need at least a second or third grade education in it. Never really took the time to learn much, but I know Austrian economics compared to call it Keynesian economics or whatever else may be out there tend to favor uh, the population the most. So, um, on that note, I guess, I, I think some, most people have already got to know you guys a little bit, but if you could just kind of tell your background real quick, Mark Victor, and then Walter, and then we'll, we'll get into this open discussion, by the way, kind of like what we just did. So, if at any point in time you have any thoughts, questions, comments, just hop in here. This is one group moment, so keep that in mind. Mark Victor. Well, I, uh, I'm originally from Boston, so that makes me a New England Patriots fan. Okay, not a lot of them here. <laughs> but not necessarily a Tom Brady fan any longer, so maybe I, it'll get some smiles, I don't know. Um, anyway, so um, moved from Massachusetts to Arizona, where I went to Arizona State University. Always knew I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. Um, went to law school in uh, LA, and I have an, a firm, that our name of our firm is the Attorneys for Freedom. We're a pro-freedom, hardcore, activist, law firm. People send me emails, hey Mark, can I work at your firm? I say, I don't know, are you really for freedom? How do you feel about this, that, and the next thing? And if they pass the test, they can send me their resume and I'll consider it. Um, you know, I hire people based on character first, experience second. I feel like I can train good lawyers, but character is indispensable. And um, for also former Marine, I'm uh, very proud to have served in the Marine Corps, although I don't agree with everything that the Marine Corps has been used to do. I see it as a tool, like an AR-15 as well. It can be used for good things, can be used for bad things. Um, I founded the Live and Let Live movement, which I talked about a little bit today. I think that we should both own the message, which means to me really get your brain around the idea that we're against aggression, but maybe even more importantly, live the message. Actually live in a certain way. Live those aspirational values that I talked about earlier today. I encourage people to lead with those, that we, um, we could do a lot better even than just freedom. I know that we're pumped up about getting to freedom, but why stop there? I think we should push for peace. I think we need to push for civility. And um, yes, there are differences among and between us, but. <laughs> I think we should focus on the most important things that connect us, which are character, right? Things that we 
uh, value. Like I said, building high levels of trust. I think if we uh, connect based on an intellectual basis, um, what we care about, things that we value, I think that's far more important than color of skin or what culture you're from or any of that other stuff, which of course there are differences, but less important than, than what's in your heart and what's in your head. And so that's what we're trying to promote. And um, I'm, I'm very methodical and no matter what issue you're gonna throw at me, I'm always gonna look first and say, is somebody aggressing? If somebody's aggressing somewhere, I'm against it. I think it should be illegal. If they get away with it, I think they should be accused with being an aggressor. They should get a scrupulously fair trial. But if it turns out they actually aggressed, they should be punished. That should always be question number one. I don't care what the issue is. If they're not violating rule number one, being an aggressor, then I think we should ask the secondary question. Is this person being a good human? If they're not, then we should try to inspire them to act differently, not force them to act differently, not pass a law to require them to act differently, but try to inspire them to act differently, which I think we have a very good case on. It's actually in their own personal self-interest to adhere to the values that I laid out earlier. They, if you care about living more productive, prosperous, happier life, the things I laid out are a good roadmap to getting there. So that's uh, all the soapbox I got for the moment. For the moment, for the moment. For the moment. I like how you vet your potential. Just for the moment, yes. All right, Mr. Block, I'm well, gonna have you here. I think I'm supposed to do three things. Uh, one is sort of introduce myself. How did I become a libertarian? Two, I'm gonna, even though unasked, make a few comments about things that other people have said that I didn't get a chance to comment on. And third, do a little bit about Austrian economics. Uh, as for my background, I'm from Brooklyn, I'm Jewish, therefore I was a pinko because, you know, it was just in the air. Everyone was a pinko there. I went to high school with Bernie Sanders. You should have mentioned not only Bernie Farber, but also Bernie Sanders. <laughs> He's also Jewish and responsible for socialism in, in, to a great de uh, degree. And I had roughly the same views as he did. Uh, I was more interested in sports and girls in those days. He was more interested in politics. But I was a pinko, and then I, um, I overlapped with him four years in high school, and we were on the track team together. And then I went to Brooklyn College, and I was still a pinko, and Ayn Rand came to lecture. And I came to boo and hiss her. Now, in those days, you didn't cancel people. You didn't beat them up. It was polite booing and hissing. Uh, and then afterward, um, uh, they had a lunch in her honor, and anyone was invited to come who was interested, even if you disagreed. So I came, and Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of uh, the table, and her buddies, um, Alan Greenspan and uh, Nathaniel Brandon and Leonard Peikoff were all sitting there, and I was relegated to the other end of the table, and I turned to my neighbor and I said, you know, socialism is the way to go, capitalism is evil. And he said, well, I don't really know that much about it, but the people who do are at the other end of the table. So I, I was a chutzpahnik, pushy, still am. And I went to the other end of the table and I stuck my head between Ein's and Nathan's and I said, there's a socialist here who wants to bait someone on it. And I was around 20 and Brandon maybe 35 and ran 50, 55. And, um, Brandon was very nice. He said, well, you know, we don't, there's no room at this end of the table, but I'll come to the other end of the table and talk to you under two conditions. One, you don't allow this thing to lapse. You continue until we settle it. And two, you read two books that I'll recommend. And I agreed. And the two books were Atlas Shrugged and Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And I, uh, I read them very quickly. I couldn't put the Atlas Shrugged down. It was just magnificent. The best book I've, well, not the best book I've ever read, but the best novel I've ever read. And I went to his house and Rand's house, and then I got converted. I was now a minarchist. And later on, I was getting a PhD at Columbia, and I met Larry Moss, who said, you gotta meet Murray Rothbard, he's an anarchist. I said, anarchist, that's no good. You know, I was sort of Randian, not really cultish, but Randian. But finally, they prevailed upon me to meet Murray, and Murray converted me to anarchism in about five minutes by using Hazlitt's arguments against me, namely, why couldn't we compete with armies, courts, and police, just like we do in post offices or whatever. <clears throat> So that's how I got to where I am. And now I'm a professor of economics at Loyola University. And I'm very happy to say that maybe 10 or 12 or 15 of my former students are now economics professors and hopefully doing uh, the Lord's work. 
<laughs> I want to mention one or two things, uh, and then I'll give the microphone back. Uh, uh, j just comments on uh, people. My original topic was very similar to yours. It was something like, why does everyone hate the Jews? And my talk would be very congruent with yours. The only uh, criticism I have of you, you were too soft on the Jews. You, uh, you said that only a few of them were um, bad guys. Most of them are bad guys. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, what's their voting pattern? 90, 95% for the Democratic Party? And uh, uh, so you were too soft on, on that. And I have a few other minor details that I disagree with, but I, I thought that was very good talk. Uh, the other thing is I had a sort of a verbal dispute with um, Jay Ant. Uh, he mentioned wokeism. Wokeism to me is what's on college campuses. It's got nothing to do with what he's calling chaosism. There's no wokeism in India or uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. It's chaosism. Uh, but those are the only two minor things I would want to say. Wow, I'm happy to know that uh, that you you are on a collegiate campus preaching the good news. <laughs> right? Uh, that's one thing that I talk to uh, you know my wife and people that I know is like. Do I really want to raise a child who I encourage to go wear a mask for four years and question everything that they learn? So, thank you for doing the good work. And I see you got your uh, your um, Mises shirt on there too, the School of Austrian Economics. So, I'm sitting here thinking, where is the the bridge between live and let live and and everything that Walter just shared? And I, I can guess, start. I was gonna say, I see Mark. I got some. I see the, the noodles going. So I got some. What, what do you got for us, Mark? I want to. It, I don't often get to take issue with anything Walter Block says, because I think we probably agree on 99.999% of things. And I, but I only want to take issue with how he said something. He referred to some of the Jews as bad guys. I take issue with that reference, and I'll tell you why. Um, imagine I was, we had Bernie Sanders here right now, and he was sitting on this panel. I would say to Bernie, you know, Bernie, you and I, we agree on most things. We really do. And I would, I would refer to him as a brother. I would treat him with kindness. And I would say, you think, Bernie, that we should help people who are less fortunate than us. He would say, yes, I do. I think people are born in less fortunate circumstances and we should help them. And I would say to that, I totally agree with you. And I would say, Bernie, you think that we should, uh, people should have access to good education and good health care. He, he would very enthusiastically say, yes, I believe that very strongly. I would say to that, I agree with you on those points. We have the same goals in mind. We only have a small little disagreement. You think these are legal issues and you're putting them into the law. I think these are moral issues and they should be outside of the law. And as a result, we should try to convince people to accomplish these same goals, but do it voluntarily. Because, see, if we put our, and I would treat him as one of the group, if we put our good morality into the law, we won't be the only ones trying to do that. There are other people who have different ideas about morality, like, for example, women should wear head coverings when they go outside. That's a moral position. And they're going to say, well, Mark, if you and Bernie can put your moral ideas into the law, so can we. And we should get a law passed that require women to wear headscarves. To that person, I would say the same thing I would say to Bernie. I would say, look, maybe this is a very important moral rule that women should wear headscarves when they exit the home or something and when they're outside. I take no position on that. But see, this is a moral question, not a legal question. And all moral questions, even the ones I personally agree with, should be outside the law. And the reason for that is we can never get to freedom or peace otherwise. If we don't, then we have what we have now, an endless struggle between people with different moral views who are all trying to get them into the law to force everybody to comply with their moral conclusions. And that's the point I would make to Bernie Sanders. I wouldn't treat him like a bad guy. In fact, 
I think the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of people on the left, the socialists, have good moral views. They're just mistaken. They're confused about what's a legal issue and what's a moral issue. If we could get them to see that, we can close ranks with them and say, let's, let's get these good goals done. We agree with you here, but let's do it outside the law. Well, this is the point oh oh one where we disagree. I mean, according to him, there are no bad guys. I didn't say that. Well, There's I, real bad guys. According, according, what I get out of that is there are no really bad guys. Everyone is open to being converted to libertarianism. <clears throat> well, I don't think so. I think there are bad guys. I don't think Bernie is that stupid. Uh, I certainly don't think that uh, professors of economics that see market failure all over the place and advocate government intervention are stupid. I think they're evil. There are evil people out there. And um, yes, there are some people who can be converted out of that, out of their evil. And I think we both uh, dedicate our professional lives to doing just that. But to say that there are no evil people and all we have to do is say, look, we agree with the goals. Everyone should be happy, wealthy, and prosperous. You think that the best way to do it is this way. You're wrong. This is the best way to do it, free enterprise. Yes, we'll have some success with that, and, and I wish Mark uh, every success with that. But to think that you know, next year we'll have 100,000 people here, I think is unlikely. I mean, you know, Murray Rothbard, Ron Paul, uh, uh, Mises, Hayek, uh, Milton Friedman are all saying things like that, have, have turned themselves blue saying things like that, and we're still, you know, a few of us, and I think it's socio-biological. I think a lot of people, we're mutants, we're weirdos. We are open to the possibility of free enterprise. But a lot of people are not mutants, they're, they're normal people. We're the, we're the abnormal ones. They are, they are hardwired into thinking that socialism is great, and it's an uphill battle, and it's like the rock of Sisyphus, you push it up, it keeps coming down, you push it up, it keeps, does that mean we shouldn't try? No, of course we should, we should try. I enjoy that. There's nothing I enjoy more than trying to convert people, but I, I think I have a more realistic assessment of, of, the, um, of the challenge we face. Let me talk a little bit about Austrian economics. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Okay, Austrian economics got nothing to do with the state or the country Austria. Uh, it just so happens that the people who started it, Mises, Bombevert, Menger, um, uh, Schumpeter, Hayek, all happen to live in Austria. It's similar to the Chicago School of Economics, got nothing to do with the city of Chicago. It's just that Milton Friedman and Stigler and Becker all came from the University of Chicago. There are two schools of economics that are roughly free enterprise, the Chicago School and the Austrian School. And we are more free enterprise than them. I like having contests to outdo, see, uh, see who's more free enterprise. I'm more free enterprise than thou. And I think the Austrians are more free enterprise than the, um, uh, the mainstream and certainly more than the Chicago School. The way I see the Chicago School is they're better, they're better than the uh, left-wing Keynesians, but they're part of that school and we are different than them. What are the differences? Well, on antitrust, we don't believe in antitrust. We think that the antitrust law should be eliminated. Why? Because um, just because you get to be big doesn't mean that uh, there's a problem. Uh, if you get to be big, not through corporate capitalism, but through voluntary capitalism. They think that mere bigness is uh, irrational or inefficient or problematic. They draw all sorts of diagrams that show dead weight losses. Uh, any of you take Economics 101? Well, then you know from the dead weight loss, you know from the monopoly diagram. Uh, Milton Friedman is a little bit better. He says, well, just because the uh, monopoly is, in, just because a large company is inefficient, even though they, uh, they got their large size through competition, uh, doesn't mean we should have antitrust because antitrust costs money. You have to hire uh, accountants and, and lawyers and people like that. It's only when the inefficiency of a monopoly is um, greater than the cost of stopping it that we should do it. So he's sort of a moderate here. 
And this is sort of like a full employment job for, for economists to measure just how inefficient it is. And I, I think that there's no inefficiency whatsoever. So that would be one instance. Another instance is on business cycles. The Austrians have a different view of business cycles than the mainstream. In our view, <clears throat> there is no market failure. The economy is not uh, sort of like a, a car riding on a narrow road and on the one side is unemployment and on the other side is inflation. And, and the job of the uh, government is to keep the car in the straight and narrow. In the Austrian view, the reason we have business cycles in the first place is because of government intervention. What they do is they artificially lower the interest rate. When you artificially lower the interest rate, you encourage people to engage in more roundabout um, uh, projects, uh, long-range projects, which are not sustainable because the savings rate hasn't changed in order to justify that. And we see the, uh, the boom as, as sort of like getting drunk. And the recession as the morning after when, you, when you're recovering from it. So it, it's the recession that's the good thing, the boom is the bad thing. Whereas the way they see it is very different. They see it as a, a market failure. And um, here the left-wing Keynesians diverge from the right-wing monetarists. The left-wing Keynesians say, well, um, you have to have fiscal policy to fix it. And the right-wing ones say, no, it's monetary policy. And we say, no, 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 it's a government intervention in the first place, which created the problem. So you can see uh, differences in uh, relevant areas. Another one um, is they believe that um, uh, there is such a thing as public goods, and we don't believe that there's anything, any such thing as a public good, and what they usually use is a, um, a lighthouse. And what they say is, well, how can private enterprise have lighthouses? Well, uh, you know, how can you charge the ships? Because the, you can't make the ships pay. And uh, what we say is that you could have private lighthouses, and the lighthouse owner has a threat to, nowadays, you don't need a lighthouse with GPS, but in the good old days, you, you know, with sailboats, you needed that. Uh, what, we could, what we say is, well, in the, um, the lighthouse owner has a credible threat against anyone who doesn't pay. The point is, if you don't pay, you can't make it a private institution. And the threat is, one of these days, only non-payers are going to be out there, and we're going to shut the thing off. And then you'll crash on the thing. And, you, and meanwhile, you're going to have to pay more to your sailors because they're in greater danger of being on your crappy ship. So we disagree there. Then there's externalities. They think pollution is a, a negative externality or an external diseconomy. We say it's just trespass. Mm -hmm. And Milton Friedman comes out in favor of government education. Uh, public schools. Uh, Milton Friedman, the, the so-called free enterpriser, is supporting public schools. Why? Because you selfish people will only consider uh, going to education for your own benefit. You'll get a better job or uh, you'll be smarter, or you'll make a better mate or whatever it is. But you don't realize that if you go to school, you'll be less likely to be a criminal. And, and you can't capture that. It'll be a spillover benefit onto other people. And therefore, we should force other people to pay for that. Well, look, right now I'm smiling at you. See, I'm smiling. I benefited you. Get, everyone give me 10 bucks. <laughs> I benefited you. Let's stipulate that I did benefit you. That doesn't mean I have a right to grab your money. And yet that's the argument of Milton Friedman, so-called uh, free enterpriser. Um, and then uh, somehow unequal wealth is, is a market failure for these people. Crazy. Let me give you two technical <coughs> things that are uh, not really politically uh, implicated, but to just give you an, in, uh, an inkling of what the difference between Austrian and mainstream economics is. One of them is indifference. We think there's no, su no such thing as an indifference curve or indifference curves are wrong. Why, uh, now look, the word indifference is a perfectly good indifference word, uh, a perfectly good English word. There are four books there. Uh, anyone wanting to buy one of those books is indifferent between those books. You don't really care which they, they all look about the same to me. Or you, you go get a can of Coke and there are 20 cans of Coke in the restaurant, you don't, uh, in, in the grocery, you don't care which one you get. So we're not against the word indifference and we know what indifference means. But they think that human action or c commerce can be compatible with indifference. And what I'm trying to say is that every time you engage in commercial activity, you can't be indifferent. This young man over here has a lovely hat. Raise your hat. That hat, paid. he paid 20 bucks for it. When he bought it, he was not indifferent. 
He bought it because he valued the the uh, hat more than the 20 bucks. Now, we don't know if he valued the hat. Maybe it was there was a pretty girl selling the hat and he was trying to get a date with her. All we know, there was something about that hat that he liked more than the 20 bucks. So he couldn't be indifferent. So this is not a, a, a political thing, but it sort of gives you an inkling of what's going on. Let me give you um, uh, just one more. Uh, we, uh, there is such a thing in utility as ordinal utility and cardinal utility. Ordinal utility is ordering, cardinal utility is counting or uh, uh, having utils. Now, uh, I, uh, I have a, a watch, a pen, and, and a piece of paper. And I value the watch at 20 utils and the, the pen at 10 utils and the piece of paper at five utils. And therefore, I value this watch four times as much as, as the pen and the pen five times as much as, that's nonsense. There's no such thing as cardinal utility. There's only ordinary utility. I like the watch more than the pen. I like the pen more than the, uh, the paper. And if somebody robs me and says, I got to give up one of them, I'm not giving up the watch, I'll give up the piece of paper. So here is another area where uh, Austrians and mainstream people disagree. They're always putting utility on, a, on an axis. Well, you put utility on an axis, you're talking about cardinal utility. So these are just some five minutes worth of what Austrianism is all about. A lot of it is uh, relevant to libertarianism. Some of it is just technical like uh, indifference and ordinal utility. Well, uh, ordinal utility is not that indifferent because a big part, a big part of their criticism of monopoly is uh, what we would call interpersonal comparisons of utility, um, which is a real no-no. For example, uh, take Mike Tyson. He, uh, he boxed a lot when he was the champion boxer. He boxed a lot more than most uh, boxers. He boxed, oh, I don't know, eight times a year, which is a lot. And uh, we would say, uh, making a, a reductio ad absurdum of the mainstream view, well, he's cheating us out of an extra four, um, uh, what do you call it, an extra four uh, boxing matches. And we value the extra four boxing matches more than he disvalues the effort of fighting four and more times. It, this is what they used against the Rockefeller. Rockefeller wasn't selling enough oil. He was only selling uh, 20 gallons of oil. He should have been selling 30. How the hell do they know any of that stuff? It's just nonsense. So I hope that uh, a, a little bit of this Austrianism was of help to you. And by the way, uh, if you want, copy down my email address. And if you have other questions that we can't solve here, I'd be happy to, and I'm sure you would offer the of course, same thing. Yes. My email address is wblock, W-B-L-O-C-K, at loino, L-O-Y-N-O, Lewis Oliver Yellow New Orleans, dot E-D-U for education. School is now in session. <laughs> <laughs> we still have uh, a good 50 minutes or so, Mr. Block, so we, uh, we will continue this conversation. I do want to just check with the audience, though, real quick here. Any thoughts, comments on uh, Austrian economics? Yes. Can I just ask a question about negative externalities? So you talk about trespassing. Can you explain what do you mean by that? Uh, the, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. She's asking about negative externalities, and what do I mean by trespass? Uh, you see, there are market failures, and, and the mainstream thinks that market failures like monopoly, business cycles, public goods, externalities, unequal uh, distribution of wealth, all market failures. And there are two kinds of externalities. There's the positive and the negative. The positive would be education, and we should compel you to uh, pay for other people's education because you're benefiting from it because that's a positive externality. So what's a negative externality in the mainstream view? A negative externality is uh, the main example often used is pollution. Namely, the, uh, the steel company takes into account all sorts of private costs. The cost of labor, the cost of um, um, uh, coal, the cost of iron, the cost of insurance, the cost of uh, having a, a, a plant but they don't take into account the costs that they impose on other people when they make steel in the form of pollutants that get into our lungs and onto our laundry when we used to hang it out on a clothesline. So they're producing too much and we ought to tax steel. That's the argument. The counter argument is that, that look, if I take my garbage, eggshells, orange peels, uh, lemon peels, whatever, uh, coffee grounds, and I <coughs> pour it on Mark's front lawn, what do we call that? 
we call that littering, uh, littering or trespass or craziness or compost. something. Something. <laughs> the, the compost is on my property, but I'm putting it on his property. Now, is there any difference between that? If I first incinerate all of my garbage and then I pour it, then I pour it onto his lungs and his property? No, it's the same thing. So what we're saying is this is not a market failure. This is a failure of government to uphold private property rights. Mm -hmm. So it's not a market failure, it's a government failure. You know, the public, uh, public choice school is sort of vaguely Chicago-esque, they, but they're pretty good. I mean, sometimes Milton Friedman is very good. He's very good on occupational licensure. You know, we shouldn't have any licensing. We should just have certification. Uh, what the public choice people used to say, when I got to graduate school, the, the aphorism or the syllogism was, we want perfection, markets are imperfect, who could deny that, therefore government. And what the public choice people said is, we want perfection, governments are imperfect, therefore we want markets. Both are silly, but I like the, the, the second one better. Well, when I went to graduate school, and, and nowadays in, in the literature, um, Pretty much all they do is talk about market failures in, in the mainstream uh, school, and uh, one of the market failures would be pollution. And it's not a market failure. It's a failure of government to uphold property rights. Love it. Uh, Mark, I see you soon over here. Jeff, any comments on that? And then Rick, I see the smile too. Uh, <laughs> well, I just loved, I loved it when Walter <coughs> talked about a failure to uphold private property rights. I mean, that's almost everything we're talking about. If you consider your body is your property, your money, your real property, your land, your personal property, pretty much that covers almost everything that we're talking about. You could state it differently and say, what are we, we libertarians actually for? We're for protection of private property rights with an expansive view of what your property is, right? If your body is your property, what does it mean to own something? It means you're in charge of the thing. It means if your body is your property, you get to decide what goes in it. Isn't that the whole discussion about the drug war? Isn't that the whole discussion about the coronavirus? We could talk about the coronavirus because there are a few other issues and Walter brought one up earlier that I think got some people attention, right? Imagine if I, if I'm, uh, if I'm on my property and I can cough a virus over to Walter's property, this is the same thing as me chucking a knife over the fence or firing around from a gun over the fence. And what Walter was talking about, I think maybe a little bit struggling, was the fact that even if I don't do this intentionally, maybe not even recklessly, I do it negligently. Well, we have a way to deal with this. That's what the legal system does, right? If I do it negligently, I don't get locked up for it. We call that a tort. That's not a crime, it's a tort. I owe damages. He can stop me from doing that, for sure. He still gets to stop me from doing that, even if I'm doing it accidentally. And it's what Walter said when he said, maybe we put you in a hotel instead of in jail. But most of this stuff is already very nicely worked out in our law. We, are, we don't have to change much about property law to get what we want, nor do we have to change much about contract law, nor do we need to change much about tort law or how we conduct trials or evidence law. What we got to do is get back to private property. What we got to do is get rid of victimless crimes in the criminal law, right? That's what we're talking about, private property. We're punishing somebody who didn't violate somebody else's private property. You put drugs in your body. You sold drugs to another competent adult who wanted it. Where's the violation of private property? Prostitution, competent adult, competent adult exchange money for sex. Where's the violation of private property? Assault, punch somebody in the face. Okay, there's a violation of private property. If you think about it in those terms, what we're advocating for, I think, makes a lot of sense. And just to push back a little bit, because I didn't get a chance to push back earlier on the evil question, there definitely are people who are evil in the world. I've represented many of them. We do lots of murders, child molestation, uh, you name it, we do it. We, we do hardcore, high-end, major felony criminal defense. These are people who say things like, I don't care about punching other people in the face. Okay, there's a certain evilness to that. That's not most people. The vast majority of people, at least on a person-to-person -person basis, 
If you sit down and say, hey, how do you feel about aggression? And you, you get their brain around what we're talking about with aggression. We're not talking about microaggressions or whatever those are or you know uh, offensive speech or something like that we're talking about punching somebody in the face right taking their stuff fraud coercion or putting them in danger if you can get their brains around that definition almost everybody agrees with us where do we lose them we lose them because they think it's okay for the government to do these things if we baby step them there and say where does the government get such a right to do these things. If I don't have a right to do it and Walter doesn't have a right to do it and none of us have a right to do it and we create the government, well, we can't give the government the right to do it because we don't have the right to do it. We created the government. It doesn't exist without us. It's not that it came from somewhere else. If there's no us, there's no government. We can baby step them through this. We just haven't done it yet. We can't get their attention. Because we act like a bunch of idiots most of the time. I'm not referring to anyone in particular in this room. I'm just a general freedom crowd. We get sidetracked by arguments over facts. Which particular set of facts? Is corona really dangerous or is it not? Okay, this is, as, as Walter said, this is not a libertarian question. What we should do here is say, okay, imagine it is really dangerous. Then what? Imagine it's not really dangerous. Then what? Let's get them in agreement on the underlying principle. If we can do that, we can get our way because the vast majority of people actually do agree with us. I think the only thing standing between us and getting freedom and peace is our ability to deliver the message to enough people in a way that they can understand it. I'm not saying I got the only way to do this, but we haven't done that so far. I don't know if I'm and calling up. I, I, I want to yeah. pick up on this. Go ahead. Feel free created, to raise your hand so I see you're, you're up next. I don't yeah. think we created the government. Uh, is this on? You're on. He's uh, on. I don't think All we right. created the government. Murray Rothbard had this wonderful, uh, his only fictional piece. It's, I forget, it's something about Hector. Uh, look up Hector and Murray Rothbard. For Murray Rothbard's answer about whether we created the government or they took us over, I, I go for the latter. Uh, look, you go to the average person and you say, do you favor uh, punching people in the nose? And they say, oh, I'm horrible. And then we say, well, what's your view on the minimum wage law? Oh, I love the minimum wage law. And I said, well, look, you know, I now I'm going to offer you $3 an hour to work for me. Did I violate your rights? And yet you know I can go to jail for that? I said, well, you should go to jail for that because you're exploiting them. Well, I call that evil. I, I, and I, I think it's an uphill battle to convince people, and most people like that. I get freshman students every year, and I ask how many people favor the minimum wage, and virtually all of them, except one or two recruits that came specifically to study with me and know all about this stuff, they, they give the right answer. But virtually every other student, Paul, in your class, do you have the same experience? Yeah, the same experience. Of course you favor the minimum wage law. Of course you favor rent control because you want to help people. And you're going to put a landlord in jail for charging more for his property? Of course, it's justified. You have to help the poor. That's what we're contending with. That's not easy. And, uh, and not only is it not easy, but I think people like that, pardon the expression, are evil. They're willing to not punch people in the, in, the, in the nose, but have the government punch people in the nose. I'm now offering you people $3 an hour, and, and you favor uh, the government putting me in jail? That's, that's not good. That, that's, that's an abomination. That's what we face. That's why we have so few people, because a lot of people are hardwired to think just that. Thank you for the metaphor. Uh, very helpful. And I, I saw your, what's your name again? Mike. Mike. <clears throat> Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Quick question, uh, Mark. How many laws do we need? At what level? Federal, provincial, regional, municipal? Your experience as a lawyer, how would you quantify or qualify what laws should be essential over, over BlackRock or BlackRock or what? What, what, yeah. What's your it, framework? It, it's a good question. Please repeat the question. The question is basically how many laws do we need? Mark, you're a lawyer, federal level, state level, county level, city level. 
The answer to me is not a, not a question of how many laws we need. It's a question of how they're, as I said earlier, calibrated. We, in theory, we could make one law that says nobody gets to aggress. Aggression is wrong. But then we say, okay, well, somebody's now accused of fraud. Well, what's fraud exactly? In some places, there's five elements. In some places, there's seven elements. What does it mean to actually say some, but one of the elements is somebody has to rely on the intentionally false statement to their detriment. Did they actually rely on that statement? There's other implementing rules we gotta figure out. We gotta define this stuff. You could say you don't get to assault, you don't get to aggress against somebody, um, and if you kill them, that's a murder. Okay, well, what exactly is a murder? Does it require premeditation? What if it's done in the heat of passion? There's all these various questions that are defined differently. So I don't care how many different laws we have, as long as they're all consistent with the bigger picture, which is you don't get to aggress, right? It doesn't bother me that we got a law against murder and then we break that into first degree, second degree. In Arizona, we have a negligent homicide. We actually have a misdemeanor uh, homicide as well, yeah. And so in a lot of places do as well. There's a misdemeanor uh, homicide on the books in certain circumstances. It doesn't matter to me, as long as it's consistent with the aggression. Same with regulation, right? We can imagine regulations. Imagine um, somebody's driving a truck through the center of town and they're carrying dangerous explosives, but they're carrying them in a very reckless kind of a way, right? If somebody hits them in a fender bender, the stuff's gonna all go off and cause a huge problem. That violates the aggression rule because it's putting other people in danger. I don't have any problem with a regulation that says, look, if you're gonna drive hazardous material, you have to drive it on a certain kind of truck, you have to strap it down a certain way, the driver has to have certain kind of education, maybe you need certain safety equipment to deal with it. All of that is fine. But if you have a regulation that says, and we have such regulations on the books in the trucker code, I once had a guy cited, for driving a dirty dump truck on the road. Okay, I say to myself, does this, does this contribute to lowering aggression? And I would say, no, this has nothing to do with whether somebody's aggressing or not. I mean, maybe you could make an argument that if it's so dirty, it's dropping dirt and mud and stuff on the road. Okay, now you're in a trespass situation. But if it's just dirty, what does that have to do with not being an aggressor? I would say that's a rule that is not calibrated with the bigger rule on aggression. Therefore, that's an invalid regulation. So I don't care about the number of them. I just care if they're calibrated in line with the one thing that goes in the law. Don't aggress. That's the one thing. I want to mention another law. Uh, there are 80,000 people on kidney dialysis machines in the U.S. and roughly 8,000 in Canada. It's usually 10 to 1. Why are they on kidney dialysis machines? Because there's a shortage of kidney transplants, of people donating Ooh, kidneys point. to other people. Good point. Yeah. Why is there a shortage? Because you can't charge for it. If I need a, a kidney and Mark donates it to me, that's fine. If I pay him for it, we both go to jail. Yeah. That's evil. And I tell people that, and what they say is, well, what about the poor? The poor couldn't afford a, uh, a kidney, therefore we have to keep the prison system. I mean, it, it's sort of like with the prostitution thing. You go to bed with somebody, and, and it's legal. You pay him for it, and it's illegal. In other words, you're doing the same thing. You're going to bed with them, and one time money change, uh, changes hands, and next time it doesn't change hands. And when it changes hands, Ill, it's illegal. And when it doesn't change hands, it's legal. Well, that's an abomination. And yet, this is the, the rule we have. People support this. People say that if we uh, allowed people to charge for kidney dialysis, uh, uh, rather kidney transplants, the poor couldn't get it. Look. In Vancouver, I don't know if you people are from here, but after three o'clock, uh, I'm in North Van, you go down the cut. How fast do you go down that cut? I do a competitive race walking, I can do uh, 15 minute miles. I can beat those cars. The, the traffic jam is tremendous. Why? Why do we have the Sovietization of the, of the highways? Well, because they don't charge. Now, if we had private roads, they would charge. They would charge, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, uh, I, I forget the, the, the term. Uh, they, they, uh, they would charge uh, 
um, congestion, charges. Con congestion charges. Look, uh, hotels charge congestion charges. Uh, 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 Massachusetts, I used to teach at Holy Cross in, in Massachusetts, and the, the uh, tourist season was around November when the trees all turned. They charge more then. Uh, uh, ski lodges charge a lot more in the winter than in the summer. They don't charge for that. That's why we have it. Well, why do we have it? Because if if we charge people, the answer is, well, what about the poor? The poor couldn't afford uh, to get on the roads at certain times. They'd have to carpool, or they'd have to go in a bus or something. But this is what we face. People are hardwired to think in, in that direction. That's why we have such great problems. Just a, a fun little comment on the prostitution thing, an argument I make all the time to prosecutors. Um, it's even worse than Walter said, because if you exchange sex for money, this is prostitution. If you exchange sex for money and you film the whole thing, well, now it's absolutely protected First Amendment speech. I say, really? You're going to put them away for not filming it? Um, and, you know, on the... Um, on the the, the, the the same issue here with private property, right? Selling a kidney, whose body is it? Isn't that what we're really talking about? If you're the owner of that body, then you make that decision. Why is this against the law? It's not evil. I disagree with Walter again here. Some people have decided it's immoral to sell, for whatever reason, it's immoral to sell your organ. Rather than go down that rabbit hole, they've made that decision. They want to impose that decision on other people now through the law. That's the problem. They, they are not clear on a difference between a legal rule and a moral rule. We got to peel that apart for them. We can't just, you can't just walk into your economics class and say, do you think it's wrong to punch people in the face? And they say, yes. Do you th how do you feel about the minimum wage? We like it. They're not yet committed to the principle. This is our mistake. We shouldn't be having these discussions. We shouldn't be having any discussion with them until we first get them to swear a blood oath that they agree with this principle and it applies to the government. If they don't give me that, I'm not moving from that. We're in disagreement until I can get that agreement. But once I get that agreement, now we can talk about the minimum wage rule because there's nowhere for them to go other than they back off their blood oath, right? And they say, well, okay, I, I disagree. Now it's okay to aggress. We're back there again. Or they change their mind like he did and they go from being a socialist to a, a free market person. I think from what I can see, you guys may have a better idea, but from what I can see from talking to people about these issues, there is no way to really win this argument unless you start with the principle get them to agree to that principle, and then, and only then, do you move to the issues. And we do have a question coming over here. Go ahead. Mark, I just wondered, uh, if you punch Walter Block in the head, is that a crime? Yes, unless he, he was threatening, oh, the, the question is, if I punch Walter in the head, is that a crime? My answer was a little too fast to say yes. I said yes, but depends on the circumstances, right? I mean, if Walter, is creating an imminent threat to me at the time and I'm not using more force than is reasonably necessary to repel his attack, then it's perfectly fine for me to punch Walter in the head. And just while I'm on this point at risk of opening up another humongous can of worms, even if you think Russia was justified in rolling tanks into Ukraine, even if my observation is they have far exceeded the minimum amount of force that would have been reasonably necessary to repel any attack that they had maybe even dreamed up, and therefore Russia is in the wrong. We're going there. Yeah. Russia, oh. follow up on that. With, All right. Uh, uh, then my next question was, uh, if a man has sex with a woman, is that a crime? Well, like everything else, if there's no aggression, or said another way, if it's voluntary, then it's fine. Now, if the woman or the man is of an age that they can't consent, well, then it's not voluntary. Yeah, so my point is that in both cases, it depends on whether there's voluntary consent. Yeah. So Walter could be a UFC fighter or a boxer, and he's consenting to you punching him. Yeah. 
And same with sex. It could, if it's voluntary consent with the sex, it's fine. Uh, but if it's not, then it's a crime called rape. The, but so the reason the consent... consent is the key thing. And it also applies to governments. We, that's the problem is we don't have voluntary consent. Yeah, consent is super important, but it's only important because it gets us to the question we really care about, which is, is somebody aggressing? Right? This is the reason why football games are allowed, right? Because uh, normally you don't get to just run up to someone and tackle them and throw them to the ground. But if they consent, it's perfectly fine. But even in a football game, right? If you tackle the guy to the ground and then you start punching him in the face, you can and should be charged with a crime for that because that exceeds the scope of the consent. And now it's an aggression. So it really all hinges, all of these problems, everything we've been talking about today is all about aggression. And as Walter points out, before you can figure out whether somebody is aggressing or not, you have to, you have to figure out who's the owner of the property, which is almost always an easy question. But when I was in Hawaii a few weeks ago, they hit me with a question they thought was going to be a very hard question. Apparently. There's, a, there's a, a patch of land where the University of Hawaii is trying to build a telescope, and the native Hawaiians have said, well, we think this is very sacred land, and we're against the telescope being built out there. I said, wow, sounds like a real problem. He said, Mark, how would you resolve this? And I said, well, who's the owner of the property? And they all said, well, the owner of the property is definitely University of Hawaii. I said, well, that solves it for me, right? It's exactly the same way we solve who gets to use the bathroom. It's not about whether what your pronoun is or whether you had an operation or any of this. It's a question of who owns the bathroom. That's how we figure out who gets to use the bathroom. Everything we're talking about is about protecting private property, whether it's your body or your real estate. It's all the same question. If you are committed to the concept of having private property, and you should be, because if you're not, then I will assert a claim over anything you don't want to assert that you own, right? I'll assert a claim over your body. We're all committed to live on earth means you need food. That's your private property. You're using it to the exclusion of everybody else. That's what it means to own property. All we're pushing for is property. Without it, we can't live. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the other question there, yes. A uh, friend of mine uh, uses uh, this phrase, compassion is aggression. And so when I think of the whole COVID thing, and Bonnie Henry, the officer of health here in BC, she would use very compassionate terms. Uh, you know, be safe, be kind, but was pushing uh, an agenda on vaccines and that sort of thing. So I'd like your view on that. Do you want to take it? Oh, you go first. Yeah, I would say just restate it real quick. That was a good question. Yeah, the, the question is her friend is always talking about compassion and be a kind person or all this stuff and then is trying to put into the law Man, I'm assuming mandatory vaccines and things like that. This is what I would say, yet another example of somebody taking their own personal morality and then taking an ethics or moral question and turning it into a legal question. Now there might be times, as Walter pointed out, where a, vac a forced vaccination, a forced a quarantine, maybe forced masks. You could say, Mark, justify one of those under the scheme you're putting out there. And I could give you a probably very rare, maybe not applicable to the corona situation, but then again, I'm, I'm not a virologist. I'm like Walter. I mean, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I don't know. But there could be a set of facts when you're violating somebody else's private property and you get to stop. We have no tolerance for that under any circumstances. You don't get to do that. So what I would say to your friend is uh, the compassion that, that she's showing and talking about that maybe you share, that I would say I share as well, that doesn't go into the law. What goes into the law is the rule against aggression because anything else is gonna allow aggression, if you think about it, right? I used to say, if they're not violating rule number one, we should leave them alone. If they're not aggressing, we should leave them alone. But, but I don't even have to quite say it like that, right? Because if you don't leave them alone, then you're aggressing, right? 
So the, quest, the, the issue always is, whoever's aggressing is in the wrong. Think about the, the competent adult pot smoker in their backyard smoking a joint where it's illegal to smoke a joint or something like that. Imagine they're not trespassing smoke into someone else's yard, they're not driving a car, doing anything like that. They are not aggressing against anybody. If you don't leave them alone, what does that look like? That means somebody, probably with a badge, shows up and grabs them and says, hey, you're going to jail. Okay, that's the aggression right there. But where does the part of government and media play? Like, well, the government the doesn't... Thing, repeat her question. What, what, where does the part of government... Aggression. Her question is, what's the role for government and media? And media. And media. So I would say the role... Government doesn't get to do anything I don't get to do. Government is my agent. Government doesn't have any rights greater than me. So. If, if Walter is getting ready to steal my wallet, I got options, right? Number one, I could try to hold Walter off. Uh, number two, I could, I could employ somebody to hold Walter off. It could be my neighbor, and that's perfectly fine too. No problem, it could, could be private security. It could be somebody who I call the government, they wear a badge, whatever. If they're showing up and stopping Walter, who's aggressing, then I got no issue with that. Now, you might say, well, if we're funding the guy through taxes, then there's still a problem there. I certainly agree with that. The media, on the other hand, if the media is a private company, and they all are, like Facebook, I support the rights of Facebook to do whatever the heck it wants to do, like everybody else, so long as it doesn't aggress. So if they want to kick somebody off their platform for whatever reason they want, they have every right to do such a thing. And we have every right to not use their platform. I know there are some arguments about them being intertwined with the government. We should stop all of that, right? We should stop crony capitalism. There should be no special breaks for any of these companies, nothing. They should get treated exactly the way everybody else gets treated. We need to end crony capitalism. But to convert a private company now into a quasi-government company and say the First Amendment applies to what Facebook is doing, I think is a huge can of worms because it's not just that. Now due process is gonna apply, lots of other things are gonna apply. We're gonna get into a very unlibertarian world very quickly where virtually everything is government run. And there are special rules for government, right? Like First Amendment rules, they only apply to the government. They do not restrict private people. If you come to my house, I can tell you you can't say, you can't say anything bad about Biden or anything bad about Trump. There's no First Amendment claim there whatsoever. It only restrains government. So does the concept of due process and the concept of not discriminating based on all these bad factors. Private people should be able to discriminate on any factor they want. If I want to say, you know what, I don't like Jews, I'm not hiring Jews, I should have every right to do such a thing. The government should have no right to do such a thing. I just wanted to add uh, something. Uh, I've been admiring his uh, jacket for a long time. Suppose I just grab it. Am I justified or not? It all depends upon who owns it. If it's his, as it is, I'm a, a rights violator. But on the other hand, if he stole it from me yesterday, I'm just repossessing it. Mm -hmm. So who owns things is crucially important. I, I have to disagree with Mark, however, when he says government is my agent. I don't really see them as my agent. I see them as band of robbers and murderers. Uh, I see them as people who initiate violence against me. They compel me to pay taxes, whether I like it or not, and they won't allow me to hire alternatives to uh, do the services that they think they're providing for me. Uh, I, I, so I, I don't. I, I guess I'm giving the anarchist uh, kind of view. Uh, getting back to, to the, the importance of private property rights, I have uh, three books that I uh, regard as my private property series. One of them is we should privatize all the roads, streets, and highways. One of the reasons for that is 40,000 people a year die on the uh, on the government roads in the U.S. and in Canada it's about 4,000. And what the defenders of uh, government roads say is, well, it's not the government's fault; it's um, a drunken driving and speeding and, and this and that and the other. And what I say, no, it's the government's failure to stop that stuff. The second uh, in the series of my privatization books is we should privatize bodies of water, uh, oceans, rivers, and lakes, 
Robert Nozick says, well, if you put a can of tomato juice in the ocean, you're just wasting your, your tomato juice. I say, no, you're sort of privatizing it, and we should privatize the oceans. Why should we? Well, I'm in New Orleans. In 2005, we had Katrina. Katrina missed us. Katrina hit 40 miles east of us, but it was enough to knock off the levees. And, and who put up the levees? The Army Corps of Engineers. And 1,900 people were killed. If the Mississippi River were owned privately and they killed 1,900 people, you know that the, the Mississippi River would be in someone else's hands. Look, if McDonald's killed 1,900 people, we'd go to Burger King. So the second in my series of privatization is privatize rivers, lakes, oceans. The third one is we should privatize the space race and the moon and Mars and stuff like that. So I think private property rights, as Mark emphasizes, is crucially important to determine whether there's aggression or not. And that's where I get into this voluntary slavery. If I paid him $20 million for his body, I now own it and I have a right to kill him. This is an unpopular view and I mentioned it um, previously in my talk, but I, I stand by it. Uh, voluntary slavery is compatible with private property rights of yourself. If you, if you really own it, you can sell it. And if you can't sell it, you don't really fully own it. Mm -hmm. But how does that apply to a question of um, we, uh, Bonnie Henry imposing COVID mandates? This issue of property, private property, Pro how do you interpret that? I interpreted private property underlies all of libertarianism, and I'm just giving more examples of it. Yeah, but she's saying Bonnie Henry is imposing COVID mandates. She's talking compassion, compassion, but she's forcing people to have uh, these injections. Yeah, so she's forcing what? people. As soon as you say forcing, or, she, no, <laughs> no, no, she's forcing people to have injections or to wear masks or whatever it is, and it all depends upon the facts. If the facts are that unless this young lady, where I'm 81, everyone's young lady. <laughs> if this young lady exhales and she uh, is contagious and she gives someone else a disease, then Bonnie Henry has every right to not only make her have a mask, but to put something in her arm uh, if, if that'll work against her will. Look, we had typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary was spreading typhoid. Uh, we had a right to force her not to do it because she was aggressing. Innocently, but still she was aggressing. So I think the answer to her question is, it all depends upon the facts. And in my view, we libertarians do not have a comparative advantage or a specialization <laughs> in knowing how contagious uh, uh, COVID is. If it's very, very contagious, then she's right. If it's not contagious, which I suspect, then she's wrong. Can I can I put a, a Let, few more details ahead. on the table? This on the, is the, the mic drop moment, Mark. You got it. All right, all right. I'll put a few more details on, on your question. Um, for starters, I would say that the government has no right to close any private business. That's the private business owner's decision. The government has no right to tell the private business owner what rules the private business owner should have for people to enter the business. To be fair, the private business owner has every right to say, you can't come to my business unless you can prove you're vaccinated, unless you're wearing a mask, you can't bring your gun, whatever else, they can't wear a red shirt. They can make whatever rules they want, whether I like them or not like them, that's on the private business. And so I think that Walter and I probably would agree, the only time we're talking about forced things being okay is when somebody on someone else's private property is involuntarily spreading a risk of harm to another person. Even if it's on the property, like I had a party during coronavirus and we didn't wear masks. In fact, we had a wedding in my backyard and people could come and accept the risk that they might get corona because I wasn't taking precautions or they could say, no, I'm not gonna take that risk. But to get where you wanna get or where Walter's talking about, which is okay, now we're gonna say you have to wear a mask there are already legal things in place here that make a lot of sense that we could utilize. Like, for example, who has the burden of proof? It's too simple to say it depends on the facts, right? To me, the burden of proof should be on the person who is seeking to interfere with the rights of another person. In other words, you gotta, if you want to say uh, there's got to be a forced vaccination, you've got to prove 
that this person on the other property is trespassing viruses over to your property. Then there's a question of what level of proof. That's a pretty serious intrusion as far as I'm concerned. Shouldn't be preponderance of the evidence. Maybe shouldn't maybe clear and convincing or beyond a reasonable doubt. Then, even if you get to take some action, we, we say in the law, it should be the most narrowly tailored means available. So uh, jabbing somebody with a vaccine seems pretty serious. If we can resolve the problem with a mask, then we say, okay, you don't have to take the vaccine, but you gotta wear the mask. If that doesn't resolve the problem, then we can say, well, okay, you gotta stay in your home. You still don't have to get vaccinated, but you gotta stay in your home. If that still doesn't work because you're breathing air and it gets outside your home and now it travels over to Walter's place and Walter's at a substantial risk, what's a substantial? It may be a minute risk, that's not high enough, right? Life on the planet requires some risk, right? There's a chance if you take the elevator today that somebody might bump into you by accident. We treat that as de minimis, that's too small. Sorry, you don't get a claim on that. So there are all these hoops that you get to jump through that's already in the law. We don't have to reinvent anything new. I would say if they can prove by clear and convincing evidence that they're putting someone else at a substantial risk, then we can insist on the least intrusive, most narrowly tailored means to stop them from doing that. And the last thing I was going to say is I want to give Walter credit for, for critiquing something I said earlier. What I was saying about government being your agent, he was exactly right with his criticism. I was talking about a, a appropriately acting government, right? Walter correctly points out that government is not his agent because it's acting inappropriately by aggressing against him and other people. But in the same way that anybody could defend Walter, right? You have a right not just to defend yourself, but to defend a third party. You don't need any special permission for this. In the same way that Walter can defend himself, a neighbor on the street, somebody privately hired, or people calling themselves government with a badge on, I don't really care that much who is defending him. What I care about is, is somebody aggressing and the person defending, are they using the appropriate regular self-defense rules that we could talk about, right? It's got to be an imminent threat. They can't use more force than is reasonably necessary. But if all that stuff is being complied with, I don't care, I don't care if it's the Martian coming from Mars who's defending Walter against the aggression. I got no problem with it. Thank you, Mark. And uh, in essence, it's you know really the, the power of, of private property is what I'm getting from this discussion here today. So um, Mark and Walter, one more time, could you guys let everyone know the best way for them to follow up and get in touch with you, any questions? Well, I already, the mic real quick? I already gave my email address. Um, that out. would be the best way, yep. wblock at loino, L-O-Y-N-O dot E-D-U. Thank you, Mark. I'm easy to get a hold of. You could literally just go to Google and put Mark Victor in. You'll find all kinds of interesting stuff that comes up. But my law firm is Attorneys for Freedom. I'm easy to get a hold of through that. It's just Mark, M-A-R-C, at attorneysforfreedom.com. Or you could go to liveandletlive.org, and it's Mark, M-A-R-C, at liveandletlive.org. Dot org. Stop sitting around and crowing about the problem and get involved and be part of the solution. You should at least go to liveandletlive.org and check the two boxes that I know you agree with and put your name with everybody else so we can stand up and say we got a lot of people behind us who have had enough. We're live and let livers and we're insisting on this rule about aggression and we're doing our best to inspire people to just be good humans. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right, we're uh, coming, coming down to the wire here at Capitalism and Morality 2022. If you guys do want to follow up and get in touch with me, it's my name, Adam at Carswell.io. Adam at Carswell.io. Giant, thank you for putting this together and uh, I guess you're going to close it out now. Such a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.